You are listening to KZT Coruscant Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. As it is Bible, July 23rd, 2022. I'll be reading narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and Psalms chapter 23. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Psalms chapter 23 The Lord is my shepherd, and I'll have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He makes me strong again. He leads me in the way of living not right with himself, which brings honor to his name. Yes, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of anything because you are with me. You have a walking stick with which to guide and one with which to help. You are listening to KZT Coruscant Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. As it is Bible, July 23rd, 2022. I'll be reading narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and Psalms chapter 23. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Psalms chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and I'll have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He makes me strong again. He leads me in the way of living not right with himself, which brings honor to his name. Yes, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of anything because you are with me. You have a walking stick with which to guide and one with which to help. These comfort me. You are making a table of food ready for me in front of those who hate me. You have poured oil on my head. I have everything I need. For sure, you will give me goodness and loving kindness all the days of my life. Then I will live with you in your house forever. You are listening to KZT Coruscant Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. As it is Bible, July 23rd, 2022. I'll be reading narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and Psalms chapter 23. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Psalms chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and I'll have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He makes me strong again. He leads me in the way of living not right with himself, which brings honor to his name. Yes, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of anything because you are with me. You have a walking stick with which to guide and one with which to help. These comfort me. You are making a table of food ready for me in front of those who hate me. You have poured oil on my head. I have everything I need. For sure, you will give me goodness and loving kindness all the days of my life. Then I will live with you in your house forever.
You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Hu. As today's Bible, July 24th, 2022, I'll be reading the narration of the autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He lets me beside the quiet waters. He makes me strong again. He leads me in the way of living right with himself, which brings honor to his name. Yes, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid of anything, because you are with me. You have have a walking stick with which to guide and one which to help. These comfort me. You are making a table of food ready for me in front of those who hate me. You have poured oil to, on my head. I have everything I need. For sure, you will give me goodness and loving kindness all the days of my life. Then I will live with you in your house forever. Would you, if you want to, if you've got your Bible, I would encourage you to grab it and go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, kind of in the middle, maybe hang a little bit of a left in your Bible. Psalm 23. Albert Einstein wrestled with the conviction that the universe reflects simultaneously two seemingly incongruous realities. And that is that the universe reflects the realities that there is a God who is both infinite and yet also personal in that it seems that there are very unique divine fingerprints on creation and the created order. In fact, Albert Einstein was in New York State and he attended a Sunday school class on one Sunday, a sixth grade Sunday school class, which is fun all by itself. Um, And one of the sixth graders, a sixth grade girl, raised her hand and asked Albert Einstein, do scientists pray? Einstein replied, a scientist? I love love that he said this to a sixth grade girl because you got to think she was just like, But anyway, a scientist will hardly be inclined to believe that events could be influenced by a prayer. A scientist will hardly be inclined to believe that events could be influenced by prayer. In other words, if there is an infinite creator God, he's not going to allow his actions to be swayed by the concerns of finite created beings. He couldn't reconcile two distinct realities that he saw reflected in the natural order around him. He could not reconcile God being infinite and at the same time being personal. And this is the same thing that I think for a lot of Christians trips them up when they come to talk to God. Because it seems that at work in their, in their relationship with God and in the way that they read the Bible, they can't come to God. They don't end up coming to God consistently or confidently, or at least as confidently and consistently as they should. And the issue that they haven't come to terms with is something that the psalmist is laying out in Psalm 23. What is the psalmist laying out in Psalm 23? Well, in verse 1, the beginning of the psalm, he makes this simple and yet profound statement when he says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And what David is doing when he pins those words, it sounds nice. It sounds, you know, like we put it on magnets and on coffee cups and sell it in Christian bookstores because it sounds that good. But he's actually making a profound statement about the character, nature, uh, the character and nature of God and the way that we relate to God in light of his character and nature. Because the psalmist is pointing to two essential realities about God that should directly 
impact the way that you and I pray, that God is infinite and God is also personal. God is infinite, and it looks this way. If you were to chart this out, he's infinite. He is the Lord. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He is perfectly holy. He is perfectly righteous. He's all power, all powerful. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's this amazing, unlike any other being in all of the universe, unlike anything in all of creation, he is the Lord the sovereign, the creator, God, very God. And yet he is my shepherd. How amazing is that? The infinite paired with the personal, the Lord who is also a shepherd to his people, God, very God, the sovereign of heaven and earth, allowing you not only to come to him, but then him coming to you as a shepherd who cares for you, who loves you, who wants you to walk with him, who wants you to experience his power, who wants you to taste his creative control over all creation personally, intimately. He wants to be near you. And it's this combination, you know, uh, that would have been completely foreign to the original hearers of this psalm. Because in the ancient Near East, there was nothing like this in terms of the way that deities were spoken of. Pagan false gods were not talked about in this way. They were unconcerned with the events of creation. And so people, they set up rituals, pagan rituals, to try to attract the gods' attention, to get them to pay attention, to get them to care. On the other hand, you had kings who at times would call themselves shepherds of their people, but were mainly concerned with their own personal enrichment and political dominance. And yet David says, the way that you have to understand the one true God is that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, and yet he is continually interested in the intimate details of the lives of his people. That's who God is. And you see this uh, personal interest compatible with this infinite power, these seemingly incongruous actualities highlighted again and again in Scripture. So when you go to Second Chronicles, in Second Chronicles, there's this situation in which Solomon, one of the kings of Israel, has built a temple that God has commanded him to construct. And as he is dedicating this temple, he prays this beautiful prayer in which he pairs these two realities when he says in chapter 6 and verse 18, but will God really live on earth among people? I love that as Solomon is praying, he's talking to God, and yet at the same time, he is lost in thought because he comes back to the reality of how small he is and how big God is, and it causes him to wonder in prayer. Can God really, I mean, as big as God is and as mighty as God is and as powerful as God is and as infinite as God is, does he really care about what's going on here. He says, will God really live on earth among people? Why even the highest heavens can't contain you? How much less this temple I have built? What is he pointing to? He's pointing to the fact that God is infinite. And then what does he say? Nevertheless, listen to my prayer and my plea. Oh Lord, my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is making to you. In other words, he recognizes that God is big and God is mighty and God is perfect. And yet God cares enough to listen to the cry of individual people who look to him. Now, Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. What does he say? I dwell in the high and the holy place. In other words, infinite. God is infinite. Eternity can't contain him. It's, it, it, he is so big. He is so grand. He is so marvelous. He is so mighty. He is so majestic. Yet, and also with him, he's not only, he not only is bigger and lives out time of outside of time and space, 
but he is also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite, meaning the person who's in need, the person who is walking under a weight, the person who feels at their lowest, when you're at your bleakest, when things are at their darkest, God is near them personally and powerfully near them. He is infinite and yet he is personal. And what the psalmist does in Psalm 23 is he links these two realities in a way that calls us and gives us confidence to come to God in prayer. That should beckon and invite you no matter where you find yourself and no matter what's going on in your world and no matter what's going on in your family, it should be a constant reminder that Psalm 23 should beckon you back into the presence of God because the psalmist, as he walks through the psalm, he pairs these two realities in a variety of situations. And the first, the way he does this is he says that God has infinite supply and yet personal provision. Look at this in Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, I think we need to stop here and just clarify that the psalmist is not saying, the Lord is my shepherd, therefore there will never be anything that I want that I don't have. That is not what he's saying. How do we know that? Well, we don't even have to go outside of the psalm to figure that out because in verse four, he's gonna say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Most people don't want to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. If you do, I'd like to talk to you. We have a wonderful counseling program here. <laughs> like most people, like that's not their desire, like to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We would want to not do that, but sometimes God allows that. He says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I would like to be as far away from the presence of evil or anything that could potentially make me afraid, but I don't always get that. So the psalmist is not saying that there won't ever be something that you want that you don't have. Nor is he saying that there will never be anything that you feel you need or where you will be an actual want. Like, I, I, I feel that I need that. What he's saying is, and this would probably be, I think the, you know, the English language has changed. And so you translate things in a way that you think people understand. And, and then yet, as language moves, people interpret want in a different way and what they want in a different way. So perhaps it would be best to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall never lack what God knows I need. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall never lack what God knows I need. Not what I think I need, not what I want, not what I would classify as being in want, but God will never bring me or leave me in a place where there is something that he knows I need to do what he's called me to do that will never happen. There will never be a time when David Lindell finds himself going, well, I am, I am in a place where I don't even have what God could provide me or what God knows would be good for me. That will never happen. There will never be a time where Becky finds herself there. There will never be a time when Owen finds himself there. There will never be a time when Elliot finds himself there. There will never be a time when Henley finds herself there. The reason I'm going to leave out Calvin right now is because that that child is, is not walking with Jesus presently, he has not committed his life to Christ. And here's what the psalm, I have scriptural support for this point. <laughs> psalm eighty four eleven, for the Lord is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing for those who do what is right. Calvin. Um, that last phrase kind of trips him up a little bit. So, but what the psalmist is saying, for those who are, the, are children of God, for those who are walking with Christ, for those who know Jesus, there will never be a time where you'll be able to point to God and say, God, you have left me high and dry. I do not have what I need to do what you've called me to do. I do not have what I need to walk in your will. That will never, ever happen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall never be in lack. I shall never want what he knows 
I actually need. That should be a thing that gives you exceeding confidence, that God has infinite supply, and yet his provision in your life and in my life is exceedingly personal. Is exceedingly personal. He knows exactly what you need. In fact, I just think, I think of it putting it this way. He's infinitely able to meet your need and personally interested in meeting your need. He's infinitely able to meet your need and he's personally interested in meeting your need. Now, the second pairing, infinite perspective and personal care. Verse two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. I always, I, I've always loved that it said he makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know, one of the names for God used in the Hebrew scriptures, used in the Old Testament, is Jehovah Shalom. It's used in Judges chapter 6 and verse 24, but it means the Lord our peace. The Lord our peace. Uh, you know, here's the amazing thing about God. God knows the beginning from the end. And sometimes as a parent, I know the beginning from the end of, of a small situation. So I know that, you know, sometimes we're in the car and I'm, daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm dying. Daddy, I'm so thirsty. You know what? I know that we are going to get some food. They are not going to die. Like they're going to get, they're going to get all that they need. And, but my inclination as a earthly father is to say, be quiet. You know, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Like let's, let's play the quiet game right now. Everybody, we're all, we're all going to win. We're all going to, well, potentially if we're all quiet, don't talk. Um, what's amazing to me is that God knows the beginning from the end and he doesn't do that to us. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows he is working out all things together according to the counsel of his will. He knows all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But he doesn't say, shut up, sit down, don't talk to me. I don't want to, why are you worried? You know I'm going to take care of it. I'm God and you're not. He doesn't do that. How do I know he doesn't do that? Because he invites us to do exactly what we feel like doing. And here's what I mean by that. Philippians, or actually 1 Peter. 1 Peter, we're going to go to Philippians in a bit. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. What does he say? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God actually invites you. He says, the place where you should bring your anxiety, the place where you should bring your worry, the place where you should bring all your anxious thoughts is you should come to him and tell him all about it and lay it at his feet. I wish I was better at that as a dad because that's what God does as a dad. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows you don't need to worry. He's told you he's going to take care of you. He said, if I clothe the lilies of the field, how much more will I take care of you? And yet he knows that we wrestle with worry and we wrestle with anxiety and we allow things to rob us of our peace. And so he says, come on back to me and I'll give you the peace that you need. That's an amazing thing. He's got this infinite perspective and yet he has for us personal care. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 29, 11, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Do you know, the amazing thing about God is he wants, he has a continual unending supply of peace for you. It doesn't matter the storm you're walking through. It doesn't matter what you're facing. There is peace for every storm. There is peace for every situation. And though he's got infinite perspective, he wants to apply his personal care. He wants you, he wants to make you lie down in green pastures. He is actually leading you beside still waters. Now, here's, here's the third one. Infinite power, but a personal touch. Infinite power, but a personal touch. Verse, 20, verse three, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. I think Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, it refers to God as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. 
In other words, he's the God who takes broken things and he puts them back together. He's the God who doesn't allow you to break into a million pieces, or if you do break into a million pieces, he is able to put you back together emotionally, mentally, physically. He is able to restore at the inner level, at the deepest part of who you are. He is able to bring healing. He's able to touch you in an instant and rescue out of depression, out of despair. He's able to touch your body around this altar and heal you. He is the Lord who restores you. He restores you at the deepest part. He restores you physically. He can restore you spiritually. And I think some in this place, you've walked in and there is a restoration work that needs to happen in your life. You need to know this. He has a personal touch for you. If you need a personal touch from God tonight, he stands ready to do that. Oh, he's infinite. Oh, he inhabits eternity. Oh, this place could never contain him. But he's got a restoration work for you. He's got a personal touch for you, tailored to you. Tailor made for your brokenness. Tailor made for my brokenness. He restores our soul. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. But here's the one I love the most. And there's two more left, so we're getting to this one a little too early, but infinite worth, personal guidance. Verse three, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Why, notice, why does God lead us in paths of righteousness? For his namesake. In other words, God has bound up his reputation and the display of his glory in the path that he's going to take you on, in applying his direction and his guidance and his plan to your life. That the God of all creation has bound up the way that people look at him in the way that he's directing you because he leads you in paths of righteousness, not for you ultimately, but for him to bring him glory so that when people look at your life, they say, wow, God is big. Wow, look at what God can do. Wow, look at how God cares. Wow, look at how great and marvelous and holy he is. He's doing that in your life. He's doing all that through the path that he's taken you on. He's doing it in the direction. So here's, here's the thing, here's the corollary to this. Do you think that God, if his reputation and his glory and his worth is on the line, is ever gonna lead you the wrong way? Absolutely not. And do you think that God, if his reputation and his worth and his glory is bound up in where you go and what you do and how he leads you is ever gonna find himself where he looks at you and goes, wow, this is, this is like, there are dead ends and then there's this. This end is really dead. I don't even know, like you are lost as a goat and I don't know what to do with this. That will never happen. Ever, 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 ever. So when you feel like you have come to the end of a road that goes nowhere, you can know that you've got a God by your side who can take you anywhere. It does not matter where you find yourself. It does not matter the, dis you know what? We all, we all find ourselves in places where as a product of our decisions, as a product of our poor decisions as a product of our sinful decisions in a place that God would not have wanted us to go, but he is more than capable of leading us out. That's who he is. That's who he is. Infinite worth, personal guidance. That's who he is. Then finally, infinite presence, personal closeness. What does the psalmist say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Why don't you have to fear any evil? Why don't I have to fear any evil? Because you are with me. 
He's with you. In the valley of the shadow of death, he is with you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the Old Testament, one of the other names used for God, you find it in Ezekiel 48, is Jehovah Shammah, God who is there. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. He wants to, you know, and, and that nearness, that closeness, oftentimes that, that gets revealed to us. We, we really find where the rubber meets the road on that when we are in the valley of the shadow of death. In fact, this afternoon I was, um, it was a really hard, a hard call to make. Um, somebody, a single mom in the church this week lost her 13 year old daughter. She'll bury her this weekend. And you would think I was fully prepared to get on the phone with her and it wouldn't be wrong if this is the way it had gone down. But I was fully prepared to get on the phone with her and for her to not be able to talk through the tears. I was fully prepared to get on the phone with her and to find her so devastated, things so black, things so dark, that she really couldn't, I mean, she couldn't see her way forward. And yet I got on the phone with this dear lady and she was so full of hope. And she was so full of peace that surpasses understanding. It makes no sense. It would make no sense that somebody who is walking through one of the hardest, darkest things that any person can walk through, namely the loss of a child, it makes no sense that they could be filled with that much hope and that much peace and that much confidence that God, that they will see God's goodness in the land of the living. That makes no sense, except if you read Psalm 23, that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with her. He's with her and she knows it, it's terrible. And yet she knows God is with me and she knows God has not abandoned me. And she speaks with such joy about that little girl's homecoming in the presence of God. That's an amazing thing. And you know what? Here's what you need to know. That sort of hope doesn't exist outside the church of Jesus Christ but he's a God who's near. Infinitely present, the Holy Spirit resides in every believer that the Bible teaches that God is omnipresent and yet personally close, personally intimate. There is no valley you can walk through where you will not find him right next to you. It's an amazing thing. So tonight, if wherever you find yourself, whatever you're walking through. I just want to encourage you as you come to God, don't just come in light of the fact that he's personal and don't just come in light of the fact that he's powerful. Come to him as both powerful and personal because that's who he is. That's his character. That's his nature. The Lord is our shepherd.